Hello folks, Evangelist Matt Bullen, Houston, Texas, United States of America, coming to you with Supernatural Secrets. And we're on Supernatural Secret number 12, Rare Tenderness, Rare Tenderness. If we spend very much time around our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we will, uh, his rare tenderness will rub off on us. And it did rub off on King David. Second Samuel one twenty five through twenty six. Oh, how the mighty heroes have fallen in battle! Jonathan lies dead on the hills. How I weep for you, my brother Jonathan! Oh, how much I loved you, and your love for me was deep, deeper than the love of a woman. It's been thousands of years since that was said, and yet. David and Jonathan, their story is legendary even today. How much they loved each other, how tender they were with each other. It's beautiful to read, beautiful to read. And David's tenderness is shown in many, many other ways. Years later after this, uh, when Jonathan was killed, David finds out that he has a son named Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, who was crippled. And David goes and gets him and brings him and says, you are going to live in the palace. You are going to eat at my table every day. And for the rest of his life, Mephibosheth sat at King David's table and ate. And David was tender with him. Oh, the tenderness of David. There's so many stories. I could spend the rest of our time just talking about that. But I want to tell you about where David got it from. He says in Psalm 103, 13, the Lord is is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. That's where David got his tenderness from. That's where you and I get our tenderness from. A rare tenderness, rare in this world, rare in this cruel world. I love what Francis Schaeffer says. There is a certain gentleness about really great Christians. There are many ways to observe this. Perhaps One of the best is to notice the tenderness for children in the great spiritual warriors of the past. Francis Schaeffer. Schaeffer. I love that. In in no stretch of the imagination do I think I'm a great spiritual warrior, but I do know I am a tender-hearted man, and I get great joy from that. I've been around Jesus long enough that some of his tenderness has rubbed off on me. I love Jesus in Mark 10, 16. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. That's my Savior. That's my hero. That's my Lord. That's my champion. That's my captain. Jesus, Mark 9, 37. Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. Ah, that's... The tagline verse for our ministry, Mercy's House, in on the continent of Africa, to vulnerable and endangered children. Our Mercy's House t-shirts on the back in big letters is the verse, Mark 937. Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. I love that about Jesus. But my favorite story of Jesus' tenderness. There's so many. I could spend the rest of this period going on about that. But let's just look at Luke 7, verses 11 through 15. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it. That alone is amazing. A rabbi, a man of God in Jesus' day, never would touch a coffin, never would touch anything dead, because if he did, he was ceremonially unclean and not able to enter the temple for two weeks. Yet Jesus walks up and touches the coffin. And the pallbearers stopped. Young man, Jesus said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. 
and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Oh, that's my Jesus. That's my captain. That's my savior. That's my Lord. That's my master. Jesus could have, walking by with a huge crowd, going on to his next appointment, said, be raised, and then went on. And that would have been a miracle, a mighty miracle, raising the dead, but not Jesus. He goes to the widow and says, don't cry. Then he goes to the coffin and stops it. He's not ceremonially unclean because in a second he tells the boy to get up and there's nothing dead around anymore because Jesus was there. <laughs> you can't stay dead in Jesus' presence. And then he takes him by the hand and takes him back to his mother gives him to his mother. How personal, how intimate, how different than the way the proud and the arrogant, even among ministers and ministry, sometimes in our day, how different, how rare, how rare. It's a supernatural secret. Rare tenderness. As I've read and studied Jesus, in the Gospels, I told you about underlining every verb in the Gospels about Jesus, underlining all the emotions, looking at everything he did, everything he said, my whole adult life studying this man. I've learned that he was a hero. He's my hero. And I want to be like him. Oh, if I want one thing in this world more than any other, it's to be a Jesus man. Not a G man. <laughs> a Jesus man. I want to be a Jesus man. I want to have his tenderness. I want to touch people. Oh, how many times I've stood in a crowd on a stage or in, gotten down in amongst the crowd, which I often do after the sermon at the invitation. How often I've longed to turn and say, I felt virtue go out of me and find that there was a woman with a 12-year hemorrhage suddenly healed. That happened to Jesus. She touched the hem of his garment and virtue went out of him. Oh, I want to be a Jesus man. I want virtue to go out of me when I lay my hands on the sick. And it has happened. It has. But I want more. I want more. I want to be a Jesus man. I want to be a Jesus man. I love my dad. He's 80 years old, lives in the mountains of New Mexico. And every time he calls me, every single time, or every single time he sends me a voice uh, text, he says, you big tender-hearted cream puff. That's my nickname to him. I imagine in the world, the carnal world, the natural world, not very many men would want to have that nickname from their dad, big tender-hearted cream puff. But I like it. Because I am a big tender-hearted cream puff. Not because anything in me, no goodness in me dwells, Paul said in Romans 7. Because of Jesus in me. I'm a Jesus man. And that's why my dad's favorite name for me is big tender-hearted cream puff. I'm a Jesus man. David said, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has given me a mighty father anointing. I'm tender like a father with Jesus' children. Oh, how many times, how many times in 38 years of ministry have I held a man as he wet the front of my suit or the front of my shirt with his tears? just because God had given me something supernatural to say to him, or just my touch, just laying my hand on him, he broke down and collapsed in my arms. How many times? How many times? I can't count. I wouldn't even try to be that arrogant to try and keep count. How many times in 38 years has one of God's daughters collapsed in my arms and wet the front of my shirt and wet the front of my suit with her tears? So many times they've said to me, you have a very special father anointing. You have a rare tenderness. You have a rare anointing. I remember one night 
at a at a meeting, so many so many of God's daughters came and fell into my arms and cried out their their pain to Jesus on my chest and wet my suit with their tears. That someone turned to my wife of thirty five years and said, "Does this ever bother you?" And she replied, "Never." He's a Jesus man. That's what they do. Humbly, but true. Oh, I want to be a Jesus man. Oh, I want to be a safe man. Oh, I want to be a safe man for the men and women of God to come and get some encouragement, some refreshing, a fresh touch, some fresh oil, some fresh anointing, some fresh fire, some fresh wind, some fresh power some fresh love, a new start. That's my job. That's who I get to be. I am Jesus to them, him through me. I'm a conduit. I love to say this. I'm a conduit. I'm a water pipe. The water pipe doesn't create the cool water that flows through it, but it does get to feel it. (laughs) I don't create what flows through me, but I get to feel it. I get to enjoy it. I am a Jesus man. Wetting the front of my shirt. It's been an incredible witness from heaven to me over the years that I am a Jesus man. I can't describe in words walking into Ciudad de la Nina the orphanage in Bogota, Colombia, and having 200 girls come running out of the dorms shouting, Mateo, 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 my name Matthew in Spanish, waiting in line to hug me and kiss me on the cheek, jumping into my arms. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Nothing in this earth no vacation, no <laughs> no automobile, no yacht, no, I, I don't know, I can't even think of anything. No, nothing can compare to that. The rare tenderness of being a man of God. The rare tenderness of being a Jesus man. I told you about our daughter Heidi when I met her in the orphanage in 2009 how they tore me away from her and slammed the van door and I cried all the way to the airport. Said, if I swim the Gulf of Mexico, I'm going to help that little girl. What I didn't tell you is that I came home from that trip in June of 2009 and I cried every day for three months. I would look at pictures of the kids from the mission trip and I would weep my kids would come to me and say, Daddy, don't look at those pictures anymore. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. My elders in my church that I pastored came to me and said, are we losing you? Are you going to become a missionary to Columbia? I said, I don't know. Are you okay? You don't look well. You're not the same old cheerful Matt we knew. I said, I don't know. I just can't quit crying. Those 200 girls in Ciudad de la Nina, those 100 girls in Amparo de Ninas, those boys in Amparo de Ninos, our son, Juan David, before he was our son, our daughter, Gennady, before she was our daughter. The brokenness, the brokenness. Reminds me of that quote of Bob Pierce, God, break my heart with the things that break your heart. There's a rare tenderness that comes from having your heart broken with the things that break Jesus' heart. Oh, let the little children come unto me, Jesus said, and forbid them not. I understand so much better now what my Savior meant when he said that. A rare tenderness. A rare tenderness. I remember walking in uh, at a grocery store in Tomball, Texas shortly after coming back from the mission trip and I heard a little Hispanic girl call out to her daddy Poppy, Poppy 
and I broke down. I'd spun around and looked, where, where, where is she? And then I realized they weren't talking to me. She wasn't talking to me. It wasn't my little Heidi talking to me. It was another little Hispanic girl calling her daddy in the supermarket. And I began to weep. I took my phone off my belt clip. I called up my friend who had invited me originally to Columbia. He answered the phone and I said, Brother, when does the crying stop? It's been three months. When does the crying stop? He said, I'm sorry. I don't know. It's been three years for me and it hasn't stopped yet. I said, oh my Lord. What has happened to me? That was 11 years ago. In two weeks, it'll be 11 years ago. And I'm a different man. I'm a changed man. There's a rare tenderness when you get on the mission of Jesus. When you pursue him on his mission. When you get around him. He's not... <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to say this. He's not sitting idly in some first world country. He's out among the weak. He's out among the poor. He's out among the hurting. If you want to get around him and get rubbed off on him, uh, off of his tenderness rubbed off on you, you got to go where he is. I'm not saying he's not everywhere. I'm saying if you want to know him like that, you got to get with him on the mission field. Whether that's an inner city in the United States or the farthest reaches of the world, I, I'm not, I don't know. Wherever he calls you to come and join him on mission. It's a rare tenderness. It's a rare power. It's a supernatural secret. I remember one time going through the dump in Belize with a gaggle of teenagers handing out tracts and praying over people and laying hands on people and praying. And suddenly we were accosted by a, a drunk man in the street. And he had a, an enormous black eye. It's the biggest, fattest black eye I've ever seen. And his mouth was all cut up. He was stone drunk. He about knock you down with his breath. And uh, we stopped him. And we said, can we pray for you? And I laid hands on him and I began to pray out loud and ask God to do things for him, ask God to change his heart, ask God to open up his mind. And he began to weep uncontrollably. I pulled him into my chest, held him in my arms, and he wet the front of my Hawaiian shirt with his tears. I prayed and prayed and prayed over him. And when I finished, he backed up, not bleary, not acting drunk anymore and he looked at me and he said that's a very unusual power you have where did you get that power I said I got it from Jesus and you can have it too we gave him a bible and gave him a gospel track and he went on his way yes it is a very rare tenderness it's a rare anointing it's a rare power it's a super natural secret, rare tenderness. Bob Pierce, God, break my heart with the things that break your heart. Once, when asked by Franklin Graham how to shake people out of their complacency, Bob Pierce replied, become a part of the suffering. He goes on, I literally felt the child's blindness. I literally felt the mother's grief. It was all too real to me when I stood before an audience. It's not something that can be faked. Bob Pierce. Rare tenderness is not something that can be worked up. It's not something that can be faked. It's getting close enough to the suffering that your heart is changed. Job 30, verse 25. Have I not wept for the one whose life is hard? Was not my soul grieved for the needy? Yes, Job. And God told Satan that you were the most righteous man in the whole country. Mark Batterson. 
If you are a Christ follower, then you have been drafted into an army of compassion that knows no enemy but those things that break the heart of God. And it's not okay to not do something about them. Mark Batterson. Theodore Williams. We face a humanity that is too precious to neglect. We know a remedy for the ills of the world too wonderful to withhold. We have a Christ too glorious to hide. We have an adventure that is too thrilling to miss. Theodore Williams. And I say, Amen and Amen. Oh, I love to study Mother Teresa. She once said, The dying, the cripple, the mental, the unwanted, the unloved, they are Jesus in disguise. Oh, how that echoes in my soul and has for 11 years of international ministry. She was a nun. She went to the cardinal. She said, Jesus is calling me to go to Calcutta, India and minister to the dead and the death, the, the dying and the suffering in the streets of Calcutta. The cardinal said, oh, well, do you know how much money that will take? She said, yes. He said, well, how much has Jesus given you so far to do this? She said, I have three pennies. <laughs> ah. Don't be too hard on the cardinal. Imagine your teenager coming to you with three pennies, saying God's calling them to go live on the streets of Kathmandu, Nepal, and minister to the Hindus, or live on the streets of of Karachi, Pakistan, and minister to the Muslims, or minister on the streets in India. Imagine. And they have three pennies. And they know Jesus is calling them to do this. I can't judge that, Cardinal. But I can tell you this. At the time of Mother Teresa's death, she had 4,000 missionaries in 610 missions in 123 countries that she had founded. Jesus can take a rare tenderness and three pennies and shake the world if we let him. If we let him. Mother Teresa, we all long for heaven where God is, but we have it in our power to be in heaven with him right now, to be happy with him at this very moment. But being happy with him now means loving as he loves, helping as he helps, giving as he gives, serving as he serves, rescuing as he rescues, being with him 24 hours a day, touching him in his distressing disguise, the poor and the suffering. Mother Teresa. She's right. And I've tasted it. There's a rare tenderness. And it's a supernatural secret. And God can use it in a mighty, mighty way to shake nations. One time, Mother Teresa leaned down to a man dying in terrible pain. And she whispered to him, Don't, don't fear. Pain is... It just means that Jesus has come so close to you that he's kissing you on the cheek. That's what that pain means. And the little old man looked up at Mother Teresa and he said, Mother Teresa, can you please ask Jesus to quit kissing me? (laughs) She knew. She knew what it meant to be that close to Jesus, to have him kissing you on the cheek. 
little surprises that God does for us in our ministry all the time. Everybody that knows me well and has been around me much knows that I love to call them kisses on the cheek from heaven. Little surprises. Little surprises. So obvious that it can't be anything else. Providences, the old timers would have called it. Divine providences. I like to call them kisses on the cheek from heaven. Our God has a rare tenderness. And it's supernatural. Stay close enough to Jesus so that his tenderness rubs off on you. I've heard the story recently of an old man named Bill who had a dream. And in the dream, God told him to go to Moroto, Uganda, northeastern Uganda, and start an orphanage for the Karamajong Bush people. He was on oxygen. He was elderly. He said, yes, Lord. Yes, Captain. He got off oxygen. He went to Moroto, Uganda. He started an orphanage. He called it Bill's Tribe. Today, there are 35 boys in that orphanage. It's fully built. It's fully developed. 150 acres, cows and chickens and goats and buildings. There's 35 orphans there. Two years ago, Bill went to heaven. And the orphanage has no one now to champion it. They have a wonderful board that has kept it alive for two years, but they need somebody there on the ground. And they need more and more supporters. The donations have fallen off drastically since Bill went to heaven. And Lisa and Rebecca and I are going there with one of the board members in July. We're going to see Mission Moroto. That's what we call it. Bill's tribe. We're going to see it. And we're going to need help. We're going to need 70 friends to give $35 a month every month to run this orphanage and to continue the work that Bill started. This precious old man who's now watching over the battlements of heaven to see what happens to Bill's tribe. It was a rare tenderness that drove Bill to Moroto, Uganda. And it's a rare tenderness that's riding my daughter Rebecca to go see it and get final word from the Lord that she's to move there full time and take it over. Please pray. Please pray for Marota. Please pray for Mission Critical International. Please pray for the Bullen family. Number one, pray that God will continue to pour on us a rare tenderness. And number two, that he'll make all the loose ends come together to make it happen for his glory and for our joy. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, keep pouring rare tenderness on us. Keep giving it to us. We want to be like you. We want to be Jesus men. We want to be Jesus women. We want to shake this world with our tenderness. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. Are you staying with me? The next was a good one. Number 13, rugged determination.